Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. We played D&D last week and we're gonna play tonight in just a few hours as of the uploading of this video, which means I gotta figure out what's gonna happen tonight. Lots of crazy stuff happened last week and in spite of the fact that there was only one die roll, the players were all super engaged and I felt, I was worried both before and during and after that an episode that amounted to what my perception was mostly just me role-playing characters arguing with each other. In spite of that, the players seem to have a lot of fun, and Lars said, feels like we're playing real D&D again, meaning contrasting the last, you know, 16 episodes with the three or four other campaigns of mine that he's played in. That says a lot. It says a lot about last night. It says a lot about the games I've run before. It says a lot about the kind of game I run and what Lars is expecting and what kind of D&D he likes. But it was the players making tough decisions. And if I were going to summarize what happened... Hey everybody, this is the campaign diary where I summarize what happened and I relay to you the events in a somewhat narrative style and I also give my commentary. If I were going to summarize the challenge, the, what was the drama of our session last night, it was, does the chain know who to trust and can they keep their mouth shut when the, when the need arises? By the way, if you ever miss an episode of The Chain and you don't want to wait for The Campaign Diary, which happens the day of the next episode, there is uh, one of the users on our subreddit, uh, Carrie P, who's also, I believe, one of our moderators. She writes up a huge play-by-play uh, -play -play of everything that happened. I'll put a link to this one in the doobly-doo, so if you missed what happened and you want to get caught up, but either you don't like video, which is true of some people, or you don't want to wait a week for The Campaign Diary, you can always go to our subreddit slash r slash Matt Colville and you will find a recap of text recap of everything that happened. When last we left our heroes, the chain were deep in the mausoleum underneath, well I say deep, I think two levels down into a, who knows how deep mausoleum dungeon underneath the library. The library is, it's both an actual library, but it's also a civic records office. It is an important location on the pellet. The pellet is an island off the coast of, Ch of Capital, but still part of the city, heavily urbanized. So when you look at the map of Capital, there is one important production center on the pellet, and it is the library, one resource center, whatever you want to call it. The heroes had recovered the document that they were looking for. They were hired by the Royal Heraldric Society, who are really in the pay of the Fulcrum, to go locate a civic document that says that House Brunadetti are the legal stewards of this island. This is a document like 300 years old. As far as anybody knows, there is no House Brunadetti, but what the players learned last week from their spy, Angel, is that the Fulcrum are apparently prepared to produce an heir to House Brunadetti who is in, who, who they have, no one knows who this guy is. In fact, it's even possible that the heir himself or herself does not know that they are the last living heir of House Brunadetti, but the Fulcrum know. The session last week ended with Angel, their spy, sending them a message via their diplomat's pouch. The way a diplomat's pouch works is an item from strongholds and followers, and it's the kind of thing that is incredibly useful when you're using the next book, uh, Kingdoms and Warfare. It's a way for different uh, kingdoms or organizations to communicate. It looks like uh, a messenger bag, but any letter that you put in it that is addressed to somebody who also has a diplomat's pouch will disappear from your pouch and appear in there. It doesn't make a copy of the letter. It actually teleports the letter. And one of the things the players realized was, hang on a minute, does that mean that we could send a letter to somebody that we don't know if they have a diplomat's pouch? And I was like, of course, that's read the how the magic item works. All you have to do is address it to the right person, and if they have a diplomat's pouch, then they will get your letter. And they considered for a little while, and I thought this would have been a really good idea. I was surprised they didn't do it. They considered sending a message to Reginald Orfeo, the, the lawyer of House, the one of the lawyers of House Alvaro. House Alvaro, very powerful house. They thought about talking to that guy, and they, they never did it. I think their attitude was, well, what would we say to him? And I felt like that was a huge missed opportunity. And the reason I thought talking to the lawyer would have been a really amazing idea is because the players got a whole bunch of information two weeks ago, all from Angel all at once. First of all, they found out that the Fulcrum is using them to try to get this document so that they can take over the pellet. So that they can say, we have produced the heir, the legal heir to the governance of this island and they were going to take it over and that would spark, probably spark the war that everyone's waiting to break out in capital. The first thing that's going to happen in this war is all the prince's territory is going to get gobbled up by other houses, but nobody wants to be the first person to do it 
because then they're going to look like the bad guy and other houses will ally against them. So the heroes are finding out, oh, we are inadvertently part of the Fulcrum's plot to take the pellet. And then they found out that the Red Falcons, who are the prince's troops on the island, think that they've come to take the library. The Red Falcons don't know anything about this document, but they know that the chain are on the island and they know the chain are in the pay of the Fulcrum. And they're like, we have to stop the chain of Acheron from taking this power center because they feel like, A, we're the prince's troops and we have to obviously fulfill our duty, even though the prince is dead. But also, we don't want the Fulcrum to have this place. And then, the, this is the real sticker, Angel said, that's not the worst of it. The wor you can probably get past the Red Falcons because you're not actually trying to take the library. That's ridiculous. And it seems like the Red Falcons are pretty on the, on the up and up. But now you have to worry about... 12 dragons. 12, the Order of 12 Dragons are House Alvaro's greatest knights. And these guys are what everyone hates about knights. They're going to show up and they're going to accuse you of trying to take the entire island. And it really doesn't matter what you say at that point because you are there illegally. You have weapons, but you're not knights. You're there under a ruse. You're carrying courier seals, but couriers don't let you, courier seals don't let you carry weapons on the island. So they'll just kill all of you and say you were here illegally and then they'll take the pellet. And that's where we left things in the player was like, what are we going to do? And they spent two weeks, because we took a break, they spent two weeks talking to each other at lunch in our Discord about what their plans were, and they came up with a whole bunch of really interesting stuff, and that's where I thought the idea of talking to the lawyer was a good idea. That was an idea, I believe it was uh, Matt O'Driscoll had, uh, he had actually quite a lot of really good ideas. Matt O'Driscoll was like, why don't we talk to that lawyer guy? And the other players were like, well, what would we say to him? And so I had a whole thing written up about how the lawyer was going to tell, spoilers, this is stuff even the players don't know. This is the branch, they didn't go down. The, the lawyer would have told them, this this is not House Alvaro moving on the pellet or trying to stop the fulcrum. This is literally just the knight commander of 12 dragons. So you could probably bluff him. They didn't, the lawyer didn't say exactly that, but the lawyer did give the players like a hint. Like I would ask, the lawyer says, I would ask that guy why exactly he's here. And if he's done this, that, and the other thing, which he hasn't, he doesn't have approval of his, the leader of his house or any of that stuff. And that, that probably would have worked. Uh, and also the players, there was a, a fan who made a map of Capital and showed you know, this entire island being taken over by the chain. The idea that the chain might take it over. But the players don't really want the pellet and they didn't really think of the library as a stronghold. Although there's nothing, it's a giant marble granite building. It is one of the, it's the only dot, it's the only power center on that island. So from my point of view, it could absolutely be a stronghold, quite an easily defensible one. It is on a hill, as I described it to them. But they're in the pay of the Fulcrum, and they don't want to be beholden to the Fulcrum. They want to kind of get out, they want to complete their contract and wash their hands of this so they can act on their own. Which is one of the reasons I feel like last night was such a spectacularly unexpected. It's kind of like the Black Pudding episode from a million years ago, where the entire campaign changed last night in ways that I had not expected uh, and surprised me and delighted me and I think is really empowering to the players. You'll see why in a minute. The players have a plan. The plan is, let's just get off the island. They have found the document they were looking for. They put it in the diplomat's pouch and they sent it to Angel. So they actually don't have, even if they were searched, right? Even if somebody found all their, and rifled through everything, they would not find this document. They don't have it. So then they ask Angel, Angel, can you do two things for us? One, make us a copy of our contract contract, not the, not the document we recovered. Hang on to that. Make us forge us a copy of our contract with uh, the Royal Heraldic Society that says that we were here to recover the courier because we have the courier, Ilario. We found him. He's super cool. And because they want to use the wounded, dying courier as an excuse to get out of Dodge as quickly as possible, and they don't want him to say anything that might incriminate them. He is just a kid, even though he seems pretty cool. And he, he offered service to them. They're like, let's knock this kid out. And so Judge, perfect, perfect thing for Judge to do. Judge basically Vulcan neck pinches this kid using the Ill Rigger's Infernal Conduit. An infernal Conduit is basically lay on hands, except way cooler. It doesn't affect as many hit points because it is more versatile. It affects three hit points for level instead of five. And Judge can use it to either, he has to touch someone, and he can either transfer his hit points to them or transfer their hit points to him, giving himself potentially temporary hit points if he's He's already fully healthy and at higher levels touch two different 
people and transfer hit points from one to the other and also do crazy stuff like know the thoughts of the person who he's touching. So Judge touches Ilario, drains his hit points, Ilario passes out, they throw Ilario on the back of Big Cat. Angel provides a copy of their contract that says we are here to find this kid and so they have a pretty good, I felt actually quite good, uh, airtight excuse to get out of Dodge. And then King asked Angel, this was a critical moment. This is when the players are really starting to use one, their resources, Angel, the spy network, and the diplomats pouch with their which which they're using really well. And their knowledge and their understanding. They're like, can you leak? This is also, I think, this idea came from Matt O'Driscoll. Matt O'Driscoll said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's not any difference to an outsider looking at this situation. There's no difference between 12 dragons, Alvaro's best knights, coming to the pellet to stop us from taking it and Alvaro sending his best knights to take the pellet. Those would look like the same thing to an outsider. And at that point, King said, we are going to ask Angel to leak the presence of 12 dragons to the factions that, that we're cool with. And so he says, can you do this? Can you leak information about the arrival of 12 dragons? Tell these different factions that Al House Alvaro is coming to take the pellet. And Angel's like, yeah, I can take care of that. And he said, send one, a message back with one word on it. He said, stall. And that really confused Lars. He was like, stall who? And Angel's like, I don't know, man. Whoever's trying to stop you from getting off the island. In other words, Angel, it took a little while for Angel to get that message back because Angel starts putting his plan into motion. But in other words, he was finding traction. He's like, I have an idea. Angel had leaked the information and gotten someone to take the bait and out off camera, uh, things were happening. And Angel's way of communicating that to the players and saying, basically, hold tight, I've got an idea, was saying stalls. I thought that was a really dramatic thing, but it really confused uh, one of the players. And they're like, I don't know what, 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 what Angel means. So the players have a pretty good idea what's going on politically. They know the drama that's coming up. They know the situation that they've gotten themselves into. They've told their spy what to do, and he has said, I'm, I'm, I'm working on something, stall. And now it's up to the senior officers of the chain of Akron to try to get out of the library. So the first thing they do is they send Odie, their imp, uh, Leech's imp, his warlock familiar, up to see, like, go invisible, scout the area, is now standard operating procedure for the chain of Akron, which I, I quite like. I see uh, semi-regularly people online saying, oh, this kills me, because the players are able to scout out all the stuff going on ahead of them. But they, they should be. That's that's part of the fun of having an invisible imp. And also, it's a great opportunity for the dungeon master to show off how other factions and other organizations are either more powerful or have thought ahead because some people have wards and can detect invisible creatures or fiendish creatures. And so an imp wouldn't just be able to stroll through. The library is not one of those places. He, I had to ask Matt O'Driscoll, how strong is Odie? Because there's like a, a big giant metal bulkhead that separates the library from the mausoleum. It's not locked. But it's still, you know, if he's got a strength of three or less, I would say he wouldn't be able to open it. But he has a strength of six. And I was like, okay, I thought for a minute about looking up how strong is that? Is that as, like, as strong as a Yorkshire Terrier or is that as strong as like a horse? So, uh, but I didn't. I said, screw it, six is enough. He opens the bulkhead. He flies into the library and he notices that everybody's gone. There's no one, there's no one in the library. He flies through to the exit, a large foyer with a massive marble counter on it that usually has a couple of librarians working behind it and people coming up to it asking for reference material. But in this case, there's just one librarian who is talking to seven or eight uh, members of the Red Falcons. I describe what the Red Falcons look like. They have red armor. They've got these really close tight, uh, heavy caps that have stylized feathers on them, carved into them. So they don't have any plumage, but they have feathers carved into their smooth helmets. Leech can hear through his conduit to his warlock, and so he's able to listen to the conversation, and they find out that the librarian is essentially trying to bluff the red dragons and protect the chain when the red dragons are like, we're here for the chain. The librarian's like, is that, um, is that, a, is that, a, is that a book? What is it? And the players stop and they realize, and my my interpretation of what was happening was she was trying to protect them, or as, and, and not because she likes them or even really knows them. It's just sort of attorney client privilege kind of thing. She's protecting the integrity of anyone who comes into the library, and so she was not forthcoming with the identity of the chain of Acheron. But the players are like, wait. 
Did we tell her who we were? So they imagined, they interpreted that as her genuine ignorance and just not knowing who the chain were. But they're like, okay, she's trying to help us out. Uh, it looks like 12 dragon, I mean, it looks like the Red Falcons are here, but we, we think those folks are legit, that they're not going to try and screw us. Let's get out of here now before 12 dragons show up. So they leave the mausoleum, they go into the library, and they see there are one or two people still in the library and they're trying to get out. They, they realize that the cops have shown up, it's a bust, and they don't know who the cops are looking for, but they just don't want to be here when everything, you know, when the balloon goes up, so to speak, because everybody in the city for months has known that war is going to break out sooner or later. So whenever a whole bunch of mercenaries show up and then a whole bunch of cops show up, everyone just sort of assumes that there's going to be some bloodshed. They don't want to be here when it happens. So everyone's fleeing the library. And this is the last couple of stragglers. This is something I did just to communicate to the players why there was no one here. And just the notion that red, the Red Falcons showing up and the chain of Akron being down here is not business as usual. This is one of those things where, uh-oh, uh, who knows what's going to happen. I'm not in any danger. I, I didn't do anything wrong, but I don't want to get caught in the middle of some big conflict. So the players see, oh, this is, people are fleeing. But now when they've got, it's been, you know, maybe five minutes since they sent Odie up. When the players show up, when the heroes show up at the foyer, the librarian is now on the desk. She's standing on the desk. She has a rapier out, and she's basically, you know, stopping the Red Falcons from coming into the library. She's interposing herself between them and the rest of the library. I just love the idea of of this swashbuckling librarian, very Riohan librarian, holding off six or seven red falcons with just her rapier, saying, if you have a request, you have to fill out one of the yellow forms. The Red Falcons are laughing. They're not taking her seriously. One of them reaches out for her and she stabs one of them in, in the finger, pricks his finger. And he's like, ow! And he laughs and they all jeer him and they find it funny. So this is not that serious of a situation. It's still a very Riohan atmosphere here. They love the idea of the grossly outnumbered librarian holding them all off. They're not really taking her seriously. She doesn't really probably think she can hold them off. She's just trying to buy time. And the heroes show up and we have our first real role-playing interaction between the Chain of Acheron and Red Falcons. They meet Lady Antonia. She's the she's the commander of Red Falcons and she talks to King, asks the ch chain. Obviously, the Chain of Acheron are not couriers. Let me see that seal of yours. They hand her one of the seals they've been given and she's like, okay, this is not the first time she's encountered this ruse. You know, the Royal Heraldic Society gave them these courier seals on purpose because they thought, well, you'll be able to flash these and everyone will think that you're knights because you look like knights. They won't think you're couriers, but because you look like knights and you have seals the way a knight would, and the difference between a knight's seal and a courier seal isn't evident unless you inspect it, people will just wave you through. And even if they do suspect, it's a bureaucracy. Most people don't care. It's not that big a deal. You're not the knights of the bad. You're a bunch of random mercenaries, you know, from another universe, basically. You're not someone that they're trying to stop from going through one of the city gates. So they'll let you through. Don't worry about it. But now is when they have to pay the piper because she says she doesn't she doesn't say you're here you know you tried to deceive us she says in fact the opposite she looks at the she doesn't she's not accusing them she's not a she's not a judge or a jury she's not accusing them of crime per se she looks at the seal and she knows the game she knows what's going on she knows that they are mercenaries here illegally using courier seals to trick people into thinking that they're knights but she's not inclined to bust them she's kind of my attitude of like a normal cop which is i'm gonna stop you i'm gonna ask you if you know what you did wrong Wrong. I'm not here to raise a fuss. I'd rather just de-escalate this situation. That's what Lady Anthony is really trying to do. She's just trying to de-escalate this situation. So she says, if I'm being charitable, you've been deceived. Meaning, if I took the best possible view of this, somebody lied to you about what these courier seals are. And she explains that, you know, there's going to be, we're going to fine you and you have a choice. You can either come to jail or we'll escort you off the island, which she knows which they're going to take, right? She's basically saying there's a couple different ways this can go. Does it have to go the worst way? And the player's like, nope, we would be perfectly happy being escorted off the island. She asks them a bunch of questions in the meantime. She asks them why they were here. They provide their four a contract that says they were here for the courier whom they have. She gives it to her lieutenant and her lieutenant says that he he knows who the hell troopers are. He's never seen or worked with the chain before, but he remembers the Tower of Dis, which is one of the other seven companies of hell, one of the other uh, hell troopers. And when she says, well, what, what do you know about them? Can you trust them? Whose side are they on? Her lieutenant says, the hell troopers are brutal, 
but honorable. When she sees that it's a Royal Heraldric Society contract, she asks why the fulcrum, she knows more about the Royal Heraldric Society at first glance than they would. She lives in capital and deals with the politics of it all the time. She says, why would the fulcrum hire you? And the chain were like, well, you know, we're really dope mercenaries. And she's like, there's lots of dope mercenaries in the city. Why you? Why you specifically? And the, the players don't have a good answer for that. Boots says, listen, we have a reason to believe that 12 dragons are on their way here. Keep in mind, this entire encounter is happening in the library, in the foyer. Boots says, we have a reason to believe that 12 dragons are on their way here, and they're going to accuse us of trying to take the pellet. And at that point, who knows what's going to happen? And Lady Antonia, she basically doesn't buy this. She's like, why would they do that? That's, that's ridiculous. There's only six of you. That doesn't seem like something House Alvaro would do. Boots says, well, if they are on their way, we don't want to be here when everything goes down. We don't want to be the reason a war starts here on the pellet. So if you're willing to escort us out of the city, let's go. And Lady Antonia realizes that this is probably a more politically sophisticated and more dangerous scenario than she was originally led to believe. And so she's like, all right, let's get out of here. And the last thing she says before they leave the library, and this is, again, her experience telling her this is I just improv this. She says, you're safe as long as you're with me. She escorts the heroes out of the library and there's a crowd of people that have gathered to see what Red Falcons are up to because like a unit of troops, a unit of the Red Falcons, there's like 20 or 30 of them have come to the library and more because there's hundreds of Red Falcons on the pellets, two different districts on this island and they are the administrators and the police. They're the police and like the city guard and the military here on the island and they're slowly filtering to the library just in case something goes on. They've heard maybe that the chain of Akron that a mercenary company is here and they don't realize there's only six of them. So there's Red Falcon guards that are keeping the, the regular citizens at bay because they want to see what's going on and Boots announces that everything's fine folks, we have recovered the missing courier makes a show of explaining to everybody why we were here which I thought was quite clever. Of course that's about as far as the heroes get before somebody in the crowd says, look! And I didn't have them say, up in the sky, uh, but the they, the crowd looks up and the heroes see what looks like a flight of birds descending, but as they get closer, they're not birds. It's an order, it's 12 knights, all of them on griffins, except for the leader who is on a blue dragon. The order of 12 dragons land uh, outside the library. They dismount, they are resplendent in their outfits. Each one of them has enameled armor that has stylized dragons all over it and the enamel is a different color for each of the different knights. And then one, uh, as they're approaching the Red Falcons and approaching the library, one of the knights, the knight sorcerer, gestures and casts a spell and they see this white hemisphere, this white semicircle drawn on the ground outside the library. And once it's done, it's a half circle. Once it's completed, it becomes a dome and the dome lifts up and spins around and goes back into the ground, revealing under the dome a unit of of, I think, heavy infantry. So they've just used battle magic to summon a unit of soldiers. They are ready to take the library, maybe even the entire island, depending on whether or not Red Falcons tries to stop them. I'm also just incredibly pleased with myself in a very self-congratulatory manner for coming up with a cool name for this episode because I wanted something that felt like a chess move. And I was remembering this classic, somewhat obscure prog album called Red Queen to Griffin 3 by the album, by the band Griffin. And I came up with, and then I realized that the leader of the chain is called King. And that's when I came up with Chains King to Dragon 3. It sounds like a chess move, right? It sounds like, and it's it's the chain and King, the leader of the chain and his machinations opposing the 12 dragons. The knight commander of 12 dragons, who is a colossal raging wangrod, approaches and asks the chain of Akron who they are and who's in charge of them, who leads them, completely ignores Lady Antonia. Lady Antonia turns to King and says, say nothing. The leader of 12 dragons is Knight Commander Valerius de Carano. He is of House Carano. They are a sub-house of House Alvaro. There are lots of, there are hundreds of different houses in the city. And he is constantly trying to goad the chain into acting. And this is where we got into this crazy, this is part of the test, right? One, do the players know who to trust? And they've thrown in with Red Falcons. Red Falcons are basically the first organization they've encountered. I would argue the gold buttons were also this. Uh, uh, the gold buttons had many opportunities to arrest 
dress the heroes and never did. But the players were still not, they didn't realize that it was okay to trust anybody at that point. So the Red Falcons are more set up to be someone the chain can trust. And they're, they're trusting Lady Antonia right now. And it's also, can you keep your mouth shut? Because the players know that if the if De Carano goads Slim, Slim will challenge De Carano. And these knights are like, I don't know. I actually don't know what level they are, but they would be, I knew they were between 13th and 15th level. So that created this incredibly interesting, to me at least, this incredibly interesting three-way conflict because De Carano wants to talk to the chain uh, and Lady Antonia is trying to interpose herself. So he's constantly trying to say something that will draw them out because he basically spends the entire encounter ignoring Lady Antonia, refuses to even acknowledge her existence for reasons that you'll discover in a minute. This is a setup that I actually had worried quite a lot about because I knew if you watched last week's campaign diary, I knew there was a good chance De Carano would be able to get Slim to act. And Slim is a six level battle master, which is quite cool, but he's not a 15th level knight. Like there's a, who knows what kind of special abilities 12 dragons have. So I actually went, this is the kind of behind the scenes. This is the me kind of seeing a problem. I don't mean a problem. Um, like for the characters, I mean a problem for the players. This is me thinking back to instances in my game where there were there was catastrophic failure. Did a whole video on this and how to avoid it without without just pulling all the drama out of my game. I thought this was an incredibly dramatic moment and a really interesting test. You know, can does Slim know when to keep his mouth shut? And so I went to Lars and I asked him. I just put the question to him. I said, "What do you think Slim would do if?" And Lars said, he'd attack the guy. And I said, and then what happens? And he's like, well, that's that's awful. He goes, I don't want to be in that situation because then it's us against 12 dragons. And I think they would probably win based on what you've told us about them. And so I could see Lars just kind of being like, uh, I don't want, this is not the kind of drama I want to deal with. I don't want to be, I, he, first of all, Lars is like, I don't want to be the bad guy on the stream and be me who's telling Slim to stand down when everyone wants to see Slim do his cool thing. And I'm like, I don't think I don't think the audience would think you were the bad guy in that scenario. But also, Lars didn't want to see Slim get killed. He thought he thinks Slim is a great character. He didn't want to see the heroes get killed. And so I asked him just a couple of questions. I was like, well, let's imagine Slim couldn't keep his mouth shut. Uh, does that mean that the rest of you are obligated to throw in with him? Couldn't you just let Slim get cut down? You could see Lars, who is kind of locked into one catastrophic scenario. Just having one option suddenly meant maybe there are lots of different options we could talk about. And so so he went and talked to Phil. He said, listen, what happens if we know these guys are coming? What happens if these guys turn out to be the wang rods everybody says they are and they challenge you to a duel or they say something to goad you? And, and Phil said, yeah, that would probably work. But now that I think about it, you know, Slim's not stupid. He was a he was a slave to the mind players. He knew when to keep his mouth shut and bide his time. I thought that was a great, great reasoning. But and here's here's the straight dope, folks. Phil told me afterwards, after the session last night, he said, if Lars hadn't come to me ahead of time and asked me that, yeah, I probably would have tried to, I would have talked myself into thinking I can take the guy, even though, yeah, he's probably 15th level and would smoke me, uh, especially one-on-one. -on -one. And so that was, I, I felt a uh, huge relief because I genuinely thought going into the session tonight that we could end up in a catastrophic situation where De Carano goads Slim into acting, kills Slim and the rest of the chain, not because their characters would do this, I'm not sure they would, but because their players would. Hey, that's our friend. They jump in and it's it's either everybody's dead or so many people are dead that people don't want to continue playing. So that was, I was a little bit worried about that, but me talking to, not Phil, I didn't talk to Phil, I talked to the commander of the chain. It's his job to deal with this stuff, basically. And he did, he just went to Phil and said, what would you do if this happened? And this, keep in mind, this is a kind of hypothetical that even though it came from me, they could have figured this out all on their own. And I didn't tell him what to do, by the way. I just asked him. I didn't even give, other than say, other than suggesting to Lars that maybe he doesn't need to sacrifice his own life for Slim, maybe he could just step back and let him fight, which by the way, didn't happen. I didn't say anything other than that. 
So that that really, I loved seeing that play out. I felt like, ah, oh, this is one of those times where I've I've had I, I've not done the right thing before, and everything collapsed. And I have an, I have a, cho- a chance now to do the right thing and save the moment without having to throw out all my cool ideas because I really felt like this was a genuine, dramatic political conflict and something the chain should be able to handle. So when it came down to it, Day Carano was hurling epithets at Slim and saying, "Who commands you?" and all sorts of other stuff and calling him names based on his ancestry. Because Day Carano is not he's not a good person. It's important to be able to play fun and convincing villains and give them villainous traits, which you'll see in a second. And Slim just wouldn't Slim would just kind of spit back at him like they're eh, like he wouldn't say anything that was too over the top. He kept a very fine line, which I really liked. Meanwhile, throughout this entire thing, as she sees this kind of one upsmanship between Day Carano and Slim, she tries to interpose herself and stop it and and say, hey, deal with me don't deal with these folks but De Carano will not acknowledge Lady Antony until finally King says if you want to talk to us talk to Red Falcons that 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 was the trigger I'd already written this out and De Carano said Red Falcons pigeons more like it useless even when the prince was alive he then turns to the assembled red falcons and keep in mind there's a lot of them on the island at this point there is one or maybe even two units of red falcons but they're nowhere near as nasty as 12 dragons unit he turns to them and he says why don't you all go back to your farms and start pretending to be knights what knights he says and then turns to lady antony acknowledging her for the first time and says would be led by a woman. This is a pretty effective way of getting the players to just, ooh, instantly not like the guy, and that made me really happy. He approaches Lady Antonia, kind of gets in her face and says, a pale echo of your great father. I knew your father, he says, and Lady Antonia nods her head. She knows what's going on, and she realizes, keep in mind that, that from her point of view, what she and everyone else in the city has been living with for months has been waiting to see where the spark of war between the factions and capital is going to come from. And being one of the prince's troops on this island, she's often thought it was going to start here. Oh, can't start here. We're an island. Why would the, ooh, but we're really hard for anyone to, we're easy to defend, but somebody took us. So she's always going back and forth in her head. Is this, is it going to be me who's there on the front line? And she is not a cop. She's a knight of the prince. She is ready to sacrifice her life to defend the island. And and this is that moment. She turns to her lieutenant and says, what did you say about the hell troopers? And he looks at them and then looks back at her and says, brutal, but honorable. And she nods her head, takes out a pad of paper off her hip and a crude pencil. She writes a note. She tears off the note, hands the piece of paper to her lieutenant and says, Make sure my husband gets this. She then turns back to Knight Commander De Carano and says, You knew my father. Tell me, did you know your own? Which you, as a member of this highly cultured community, knows is me stealing a line of dialogue from Lawrence of Arabia. In fact, the players all went, ooh, and Slim was like, oh, that's, that, that was good. That was a good one. And De Carano smiles. And I think he bowed a little bit, and he takes his glove off, takes one glove off, and throws it on the ground in front of Lady Antonia. And she picks the glove up and slaps him with it. And at that point now, there's going to be a duel. Uh, they approach each other, and Lady Antonia takes her sword and draws it only halfway out of her sheath, but she does it using her left hand, and she does it backhanded. She's not trying to pull. She's, like, showing her sword, and as soon as she does that, De Carano cuts her down, lightning fast, six strikes, which gives you some idea of how high level this guy is. He can attack six times in one round and she, her body is collapses to the ground. She's bleeding rent in many places, blood everywhere. At this point, the chain of Acheron spring into action. King and Slim had concocted a plan while this standoff had been going on, and Slim grabs Lady Antonia's dead body and slings it over his shoulder. At this point, the lieutenant, who's much younger than Lady Antonia and a lot more reactionary, turns to King and says, do nothing, and then points to Slim and says, hang on to her. Now it is the lieutenant against Knight Commander De Carano, and the lieutenant is much easier to goad than Lady Antonia was. And De Carano knows that he 
turns to Lieutenant on all the assembled Red Falcons, and he's really talking to the civilians, the hundreds of civilians who at this point have gathered around to witness what had happened. And by the way, I think I left this out. There's a reporter in the crowd who's taking all of this down. Knight Commander De Carano turns to the assembled audience, and he says, I think it's time for a more ad reasonable administration to take over the pallet. These guys can't even handle a small mercenary band. The Lieutenant confronts De Carano and says, you have no authority here. This is still the prince's land, and we are its legal administrators. Slim, at this point, I think, believes that the balloon is about to go up, that this lieutenant, he realizes that this lieutenant is not Lady Antonia and is not going to be able to de-escalate the conflict, so Slim moves forward. He's ready to attack, and the lieutenant turns to King and says, control your men in case you haven't noticed, we are outnumbered. At which point, you hear a voice from the crowd say, says who? This is Angel's plan. This is what he was telling the heroes to stall for. The crowd parts and a group of soldiers emerge. They are wearing red and black livery and they have green boots, they have deep green boots. I tell the players they recognize the leader of this unit of elite scouts. It's Corporal Mud. She is a female wizard and the leader of the advancers, the chain of Acheron's harriers. And she approaches King and says, we got here as soon as we could. We figured Sweet would try to get to capital. I still can't figure out, she says, still haven't been able to figure out how you got here before us. Because she doesn't know about the Rossos Yellow and their ability to go through the Maelstrom. Mud asks what happened to Sweet, and King says, Sweet didn't make it. Sweet's gone. And Mud takes this in stride. She's a soldier after all, and she's like, wait. That makes you commander. And she slaps King on the shoulder and says, Commander King. King explains this is a very complex situation. We have a lot to talk about. And Mud says, well, we are well fed, well rested, ready for a fight. And then she turns to the 12 dragons and says, who are these assholes? Lord De Carano refactors what's happening as he realizes that there's Red Falcons who are obviously going to oppose him, but also the chain of Acheron are now on the game board. A minute ago, there were just six of them, and they would be easily neutralized by the 12 dragon knights. But now they have their own unit, and this unit is a, a unit of super elite light infantry. The 12 dragons unit is more heavily armed, but they're nowhere near as experienced as the advancers. The advancers are probably among the most experienced troops in the entire city. But De Carano still favors his chances, and he confronts Mud and says, who let you? These people all have weapons. Of course they do. It's a unit of scouts. These people all have weapons. Who let you on the island? And everyone looks at Mud, and Mud doesn't even realize that there's an issue, by the way, because she hasn't gone through the whole rigmarole of living in capital and who can use weapons and spells and stuff like that. She looks at King and she shrugs and she's like, Navy guys let us in. You know, the ones with the crow or the raven or whatever it is. And that, so De Carano has already been dealt one blow. The, uh, the organization that he had counted as not really in this game are definitely in this game. They have their own army with them. And then now he has to refactor it again. Because if the Navy guys, this is Angel's plan, if the Navy guys let Mud and this unit of scouts onto the island, that means House Verona is backing the chains play. And the players didn't know this, but this, this gets back to the advice, the, the unsent letter to the lawyer, Reginald Orfeo, who would have said, 12 dragons are there on their own. This is De Carano taking the initiative. If House Alvaro found out about this, they would probably disapprove very strongly. And so now he's like, all right. So he's, he essentially at this point is outplayed. King has successfully, with the help of Angel and some ideas from uh, Matt O'Driscoll and Anna, King has successfully outmaneuvered Knight Commander De Carano. And De Carano says, all right, we're going to let you guys go. And that's, that's the compromise, is the lieutenant who was worried about a lot of stuff. Mostly he's worried about the keeping the peace. He's like, we're, we're taking these guys to the docks. And De Carano's like, we're going to stay here. And at that point, they, they break. Uh, that's, that's a push. So they, the, you know, the lieutenant turns to King and says, come with me. And they, they leave. They leave. They escort the chain of Acheron and the advancers out of the off the off the hill that the library is on. But they're leaving Knight Commander De Carano and a unit of troops in the library, which means that one part of the pellet. It actually, what I described was the map of capital, the diplomacy map of capital. The the pellet. That one part of that island flips over to being in House Alvaro's command, but that's not true. They have a unit 
there, right? So they have a square, a colored House of Arles square there. This is the diplomacy giving it, but they don't control that district until a year or one season has passed, one turn in diplomacy. They have to hold it at the end of next year, except we're not using years and seasons. We're probably using something like months. And this also dovetails into strongholds and followers, where I describe you can go get a stronghold or you can build a stronghold, but it's not actually yours until you've defended it against all the people who want to take it from you. That is the christening. That's the thing that actually makes it yours. So they are going to have to defend this against from the Red Falcons and whoever else shows up. But it is a huge moment in the campaign and the chain of Akron were there. And who knows how that could have gone. It could have gone any number of ways. The Lieutenant of Red Falcons leads the chain of Akron off the hill. And as soon as they're out of the eye line of 12 dragons, King brings or uses Revivify on Lady Antonia and she comes back to life and is disoriented and she clasps King's shoulder and says, you saved my life. I owe you mine. I owe you a blood debt. And there's some talk about whether or not De Carano is going to come after King because King brought her back or come after her. And she has to explain, no, you know, honor has been satisfied. You would understand if you were Rioan. This is something I had really not considered the idea that King would try. I, in the past, I have factored the player's abilities into my plans. Like I knew King would instantly try to revivify Angel if he saw Angel recently dead within a minute and counted on that as a ruse to get them to trust the changeling. But in this case, I had not really considered King King, I certainly had not considered King raising Lady Antonia. In fact, if I were to guess what I thought was going to happen, I would have guessed that the chain would try to stop De Carano from killing Lady Antonia in the first place. And it would have been a huge bloodbath and who knows what would have happened. Uh, so yeah, I was like, oh wow. So Lady Antonia now owes, first of all, the, what I had expected to happen was Lady Antonia gets cut down by De Carano. The lieutenant ends up in charge. And as soon as there's a breather, the lieutenant turns to King and says, well, you're the highest ranking soldier on the island. What are your orders? And at that point, the chain of Akron would absorb Red Falcons. That was my plan. That's what I thought was going to happen. It was going to get the, the chain of Akron a lot of power in the city. But raising Lady Antonia meant, mm, okay, well, that's not going to happen. So she's in charge still. She says, listen, we can either get you off the docks or let's, let's get you back to the jailhouse because we have a lot to talk about. They go back to the jailhouse and Lady Antonia makes it clear that you are our guests. We'll go to the mess hall. She has drinks brought. Slim offers to train Lady Antonia in his fighting, in his gift fighting ways. And Lady Antonia is like, I don't know how much training it would take to beat De Carano. It wasn't a question of like, what class I am. Being a battle master wouldn't have helped. He's, he's one of the strongest knights in the city. There's a lot of negotiation. I can't really go over the entire thing, but there's a lot of information being traded back and forth. The players between Lady Antonia, between the Red Falcons and the chain, the players had decided to let Lady Antonia know some of the truth, but Boots basically spills the beans and gives them, gives her a copy of their real contract and explains about the fulcrum and House Brunadetti. And this is the first time Lady Antonia really understands that she's caught in the middle. Before it was hypothetical, but now it's the fulcrum versus House Alvaro. And what does she want? When she looks at the contract and she sees the Royal Heraldic Society, that doesn't fool her. She's like the fulcrum. And she says, this is again, this is a line I stole from Casablanca. She's like, well, you lied to us, but that doesn't count because we didn't believe in the first place and the players like that and she gives the contract back to them and the players are really surprised by the way that boots kind of gave everything away but boots is like listen she just gave her life for us and we raised her at this point what's the point of being a, a, of subterfuge lady antonia absorbs this information about the fulcrum and house alvaro and, and she even forwards the idea that you know, we're the prince's troops. Maybe we should just let them fight and then we'll work for whoever wins, right? At the end of the day, someone's going to end up in charge. Someone's going to end up the next prince. And do I want to get all my people killed just because these two houses want to go at it? Everyone knows there's going to be a war anyway. Boots hands Lady Antonia the real contract and explains what they're doing here and says, Lady Antonia, if we fulfill this contract, it means that the fulcrum have right and title through this heir that they claim they have, which we, we believe is real, the heir to House Brunadetti, they will claim right and title to the pellet. And at that point, it's war. And the lieutenant says, war, have you have you looked at today's broadsheets? And she puts down the broadsheet and the broadsheet. They've read headlines before, but none this big. It just says 
war. And it talks about all the different princes' territories in the city and how they are being occupied. And there's open battle right now in the stays because two different factions are going to war over the citadel, probably the Fulcrum and House Navarre, which is the house of the church. That's where the Knights of St. Pilario the Aspirant are from. They're the ones who hired these mercenaries. The mercenaries were cutouts. They were plausible deniability but in case they failed, but they didn't fail. And so now they're being supplied with troops and aid by the Knights of St. Pilario, who are part of House Navarre. So now it's the Fulcrum versus House uh, Navarre. And there's also a story about what's happening on the pallet. But the uh, person writing the story didn't know how, which way it was going to go. So they're describing it as being more like a war than it actually was. There was no fighting. It, the, the Alvaro's troops haven't actually taken it yet. They're, they've just invested it. They've just occupied one district of the pellet. If no one does anything, then they will definitely have taken it. As the players are absorbing this information contained in the broadsheet, Lady Antonia turns to King and says, what would you do in my shoes? And King does a great does a great little speech where he says, let me tell you about what happened in Black Bottom. We took a contract and we were betrayed and we could have stayed and fought, but we didn't. We retreated and we licked our wounds and now we're in a position to fight again. So you, you, there's another option and the options not work for these guys or work for these guys. The options may be do nothing for now and wait for stronger allies. Lady Antonia leaves them alone to talk about everything they've learned about. The players spend 20 or 30 minutes talking about what has happened, what is going to happen. And then Lady Antonia comes back in. She has a bag. She has a, like a, a leather bag that she shakes and she looks in and she counts and she's like, there's only five in here. She turns to her lieutenant and says, there's only five in here. And he's like, five's all we got. And she's like, well, give me yours. And he's like, I don't want to give you mine. And she's like, come on, I'll get you another one. And so he takes his knight's seal off his hip and puts it in the bag. And she takes the bag and comes in and then hands out seals to all six of the members of the chain of Acheron and says, these are the prince's seals. You're now officially knights in the prince's service. Not, not, and they're, they're red falcon seals. I think they might, they might be generic prince's seals. I actually don't know what I said. The players are a little bit overwhelmed as they realize what has happened. Lady Antonia has just given them the prince's seals. They're now knights of the city. They can go, this is something they've been trying to figure out how to get for months now of real play. They're like, now we can go wherever we want. We can do whatever we want. We still have to figure out how to cast spells. That's a whole other organization to get, uh, to get bonded so they can be spellcasters. But we can now go anywhere we want in the city and we managed to do that without having to ally ourselves with any of the different houses these are the prince's seals and the prince is dead so that for them was a huge moment and it was for me it genuinely felt to me in the moment like this was something lady antonia did not something i did this was not something planned not something in my notes this was just me trying to imagine what lady antonia would do she would make them knights king says if the if things go bad here and there's war between the fulcrum and House Alvaro or House Alvaro and House Verona, who backed us, unbeknownst to King, got our scouts on the island. Uh, and you need to get out of the city. Let us know we have our own ship. And, you know, you would make great soldiers in the chain. And sh that's when she's like, listen, if there's going to be a war, the war is to figure out who the next prince is. And I'm just going to end up serving the next prince. I just really don't want it to be House Alvaro. And so the player's like, okay, cool. And at that point, they're grateful to Lady Antonia. She says, if you need anything, you saved my life. I owe you a blood debt. Let me know. The player's like, you sort of have paid that with these seals. But now they have a friend in the city who runs an entire organization and has a small army. They go back to the Somnium Tenebris. The Somnium Tenebris is going to take them to the back to the stays, back to the Pharaoh's dream or the prince's footstool, depending on which tavern they want to stay in. And that was the end of the session. It was pretty remarkable. There was a lot of role playing left, a lot of back and forth, a lot of downtime talk. And I basically explained that like the next... This is the end of the adventure. Congratulations. You've leveled up. You're now all seventh level, which I think is a pretty good rate. Uh, it's almost one almost one level every, I guess, like seven and a half sessions, which is not bad. And I asked them all what they wanted to do. And I explained like the next session was going to be more of a downtime session where I went from player to player and, and role played them doing different things in the city because they can go anywhere they want now. And I made a list of all the stuff that they want to do. And also it's going to be me setting up the next adventure, which I'm super eager for. That's it. That was an extraordinary extraordinary session. I really felt like it could have gone, it could have been a lot of not fun for the players to sit there and listen to me role playing these two different characters, Lady Antonia and Knight Commander De Carano, and just be bored and feel like we, we're not doing anything. But 
afterwards, when we talked about it, they all agreed that it was an incredibly tense situation. And it really was about them knowing who do we trust? What do we do? Raise Lady Antonia from the dead. Brilliant. And also, can we can we not get in a fight with 12 dragons, even though we really want to? It's basically the Calarol the Vile test, which Phil has never gone through. Uh, Lars has gone through it probably more than once, because he's played in three or four of my campaigns at Turtle Rock Studios. So he knows what it's like to have to kind of bide your time and say nothing now, because later on we'll be higher level and we'll be able to fight this guy. And they passed both tests with flying colors. They did things I didn't expect. They didn't, there was only one die roll made, judge made, and did an intimidate test, I think. There was, there was no, there was, there was no sense on their part that it was them as audience members. They didn't feel like audience members, and that was huge for me. Considering going into this session, I was incredibly down. I was incredibly like, oh, this is just going to be another situation where, where, where people just get frustrated with their choices and people, characters die or they don't feel like they, they had an option. And it might be the end of the campaign is what I thought based on some of the discussions I'd had with Lars. But then afterwards, Lars said, felt like real D&D &D for like the first time in a long time. And I think what he meant was felt like it was up to us. Right. He didn't like I talked to Lars. He didn't like Lars is my best friend. He didn't like taking the library job because he didn't want to work for the fulcrum. But he didn't feel like he had a choice. He did, and 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 I had to explain to him, you always have a choice. You, he said, could we have gone? Could we leave the city? I'm like, absolutely, you can. You can go wherever you want. He goes, what if we want to go back to the desert and go recruit a bunch of um, not Hagar and a bunch of Kehmite troops because they just fought uh, Ajax? I'm like, you can do that, but all the best troops are dead, and you can do whatever you want. You you shouldn't feel like you have to take this content just because it's what's in front of you. It may just mean that we get together, we play for 30 minutes, and you, and and then that's it. And I have to go make up more content for next week. That's fine. I think Lars was kind of worried about the stream and stuff like that. So it, things turned out incredibly well. It definitely felt to the players like they were back in the driver's seat. And now they're going to be even more in the driver's seat, which I'm really looking forward to. And yeah, over, overall, going into it, really skeptical that it was going to be good. And then coming out the other end, I think it was one of the more successful sessions I've run, which just goes to show that a lot of being a dungeon master is not your, your planning, but what happens in the moment? Lady Antonia's decision to make them knights was not something I had planned, but it came off really well. There was also something that I haven't covered in the diary, but that was something I was talking to my, my friends about when there was a moment where um, I interrupted Boots. I, as I think it was De Carano, or maybe might have been Lady Antonia, interrupted Boots in the middle of him saying something, and he said, hey, can I finish? And I went, okay, yeah. There's a technique that I have developed and I have deployed many times successfully where I, in character have an NPC interrupt another player speaking in character. And I do that on purpose because I feel like the players spend a lot of time thinking, what would my character say? What would my character say? What would my character say? And trying to come up with, you know, um, a speech or whatever. And then I will try to short circuit that and interrupt them because in that moment, suddenly now they have to react. And most of acting is reacting. And now they have to speak extemporaneously in character. And in my experience, that's when you really see the character come out. But I tend to do that with my old gaming group that we've known each other for 30 years, and none of them are actors, but they're all highly experienced role players, and they can really get into character. Getting into character doesn't have anything to do with being an actor or theater training. It's almost more of a, like a writing task, just knowing who your character is and what they want and how that would be different than what you would want on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. And so this technique I had developed works really well when you have very experienced players. But when you're dealing with players who are super not experienced, they are not in a position to extemporaneously play their character, and they get really frustrated when you interrupt them. So it was something I've been trying to back off of, and I'm trying to do better in the future. That's it, folks. That's That was the session. It was one of the shorter sessions, but I think it's going to turn into one of the longer campaign diaries. I appreciate you putting up with all this and tuning in. The next session is, I think, going to have a lot of interesting, neat little bits. The challenge for the next session is going to be me being able to keep every player's interest as we switch back and forth between different characters, downtime activities spread out across the city. And I'm going to try and get some of that done before we start playing, which I realize isn't necessarily fair to you, but it's organizationally, it's probably better for the session if the players have some idea, if I have some idea what the players are going to be doing and I can sort of begin the process of ramping them up to being in different places, working on different things. And it's all, they're also going to start having 
some uh, they're going to start detecting the presence of the next adventure as they do it, which I am super excited by because I think right now the players are very frustrated because they don't understand how to achieve their ultimate goal. How does any of this stuff help us rebuild the chain of Acheron? Well, for one thing, just hanging out in capital has helped because Mud and the Advancers have shown up. But also, they've now put themselves out there for the first time. The Underdark job, nobody knew about. So doing it got them a lot of money and a lot of magic items, but it didn't get any press. And so there was no opportunity for people in the city to hear about them and come join them. So now they've done something, they've got a little bit of press, they're going to get some more. But also, it's not clear to them, we need an army, but they're also going to need to fight and beat Ajax the Invincible. And starting next session, although it may not be obvious to them at the time, if I'm a good dungeon master, it won't be obvious to them at the time, I probably won't be able to resist giving away but they're going to the, the beginning of the adventure that is going to end up with them in a position to actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with ajax will start so i hope that this was not too long and moderately entertaining and possibly enlightening thanks for sticking around folks if you enjoy this content uh obviously you know about strongholds and followers there's a link in the doobly-doo we're gearing up for our next kickstarter kingdoms and warfare we had our first big art meeting here because we want to get a lot of art done for the kickstarter we are not waiting for revenue from the kickstarter to start doing the work we're already contacting artists and getting art done for the book but also we have a patreon you can come by and support that's probably the best way apart from buying the book the patreon is probably the best way to support us we're also going to talk about uh, different rewards that we got like physical rewards and stuff that we can do research in and, and make things we can make that we can use to uh incentivize people to support us on patreon that would be a lot of fun stuff we could probably sell in a store but give away to our patrons i think that's probably how it's going to work so i will see you folks live online tonight in just a few hours until then peace out <laughs>